It's not every day that you get to speak to someone that's had a huge impact on your life. Craig Stitt was one of the artists on Sonic 2 and I got to chat to him about his experiences. I was super excited, so let's just get cracking. Honestly, we weren't terribly impressed um, the very first time we got it. Uh, Mark was really impressed technically. He, he was looking at it from a programming standpoint and, and, and you know, what the Genesis was capable of. I remember him looking at the loop just going and seeing how Sonic would pass in front of objects and then behind objects. He's like, how did they do that? Um, the water effects, he's you know, thinking, like, how did they do that? Uh, so he was looking at me. So from that point of view, we were all impressed. Uh, visually, we were impressed. Like, it was a beautiful game. Um, the character was awesome. We loved the character. I have this memory of, of, of you know, the idle animation. The first time Sonic turns and looks at the camera and taps his foot, we're just going, that is cool. That is awesome. Um, but gameplay-wise, we'd play for a few minutes, go, yeah, this is pretty, but, and we'd go back to work. Um, and then I'm not sure how long later, if it was weeks or a month or two later, uh, we got a second card that we started fighting over who got to play it. And if my recollection is correct, the only thing that really changed was the rings. If I remember right, in the first one we had, you collected rings. There were rings to pick up. But when you got hit, the rings didn't fly away in the shower of rings. Now it did. When you got hit now, rings went flying. And that changed the game. That, yeah, that just told, now we, now we were fighting over who got to play it. No, you got to go back to work. It's my turn to play. Um, and so it was, it, was, it was amazing looking back at it, just that simple thing of what made it an okay game to being an absolutely addictive, fun game. The depressing point at that point um, was realizing, because when Mark developed um, the idea for Kid Chameleon and put the team together to make it, you know, there were a couple things that I, that I know that he wanted to do. One, he knew Sega was looking for a mascot to go up against this little plumber guy. And two, um, he wanted to make the longest game on the Genesis. And so we were really, and it was, he was, we were really hoping our little kid or Kevin or Casey or whatever he was going to be called um, would be Sega's mascot when we saw Sonic. It's like, no, 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 that's, <laughs> we're not going to be their mascot. We can still get the longest game on the Genesis. We're not going to be their mascot. And uh, so that, that, was, that, was, that was a bittersweet scene, this, this awesome game. You know, Naka had quit Sega, and Mark talked him into coming to the United States to do Sonic 2, because Sonic 2, all of a sudden, you know, Sega realized they needed the Sonic 2. Naka had quit. And so when Naka came, um, Yasuhara and, and, and some of the other Japanese came to America. My understanding is similar, but quite different at the same time, is the foundation of STI was, it was supposed to be people coming from Japan, to teach Americans how to make games that would think in Japanese mentality in making games. And we, if there were supposed to be a handful of Americans that would go and work in Japan to learn the Japanese style and also help the Japanese understand the American mentality. Because it was very important to Sega that they start making games that would sell in America. My understanding is that one of the first people to come over, at least with the, he came, was Yasuhara. After he finished Sonic 1, came to STI and was working at STI when Sega realized we need, a, we need Sonic 2 and we need it now. Um, Naka had quit. He didn't like working at Sega. He was friends with Mark. Mark had met him when, he, when Mark was working in Japan. He'd become friends with Mark. And so Mark's pitch to Sega was, hey, we have the designer already here. I can talk Naka into coming to the United States to work with me if you give him a big bag of money as well. I've heard different amounts of how much he got, how much Naka got paid bonus up front to come play. Um, and so that's how we ended up with, with the lead designer and the lead programmer was Yasuhara was already here and Naka, Mark convinced Naka to come to America and work with him. I have some bad feelings towards Naka. Um, he was difficult to work with. Uh, he didn't like speaking English. 
Um, which I, that, that, I'm not mad at him for that. I, I can totally appreciate not being comfortable speaking a foreign language. Um, but he did not like working with the Americans, period. I, I don't think, I think if, he, if, he, if we'd all spoken Japanese, I don't think it would have made any difference. You know, maybe a little difference. Um, and so, um, now during the, during Sonic 2, it was fine. I didn't have, you know, I don't remember having any issues with him. Um, it was after Sonic 2. And because I had, you know, um, I would, you know, been told I would be one of the lead artists on Sonic 3 and was really looking forward to that. Um, and then Naka says, well, you know, Naka's go to to get what he wants is I'll quit if you don't give me this. So if you don't give me an all Japanese team, our own offices separate from the rest of STI, I'll quit. And so he got, they brought in more people from Japan. They gave him a separate office. At this point, STI had moved from our independent offices into the first floor of the Sega building at Redwood City. Uh, but we were still on one big office. Sonic 2 finishes, they took the, the, across the hall. Sonic 3 team was in there. They had their own lock, their own key cards. Our key cards wouldn't open their doors. Um, and they were completely independent. Out of all the art I, I, I've done in any of the video games I've done, my favorite art is still the Hidden Palace. Yeah, that's, um, that was the first art I did for Sonic 2. Once again, reading back through my journals, there is a little comments here and there about how stressful working on that game was. Um, because I am, you are working with people like Yasuhara and Yamaguchi that, by my definition, are A-level artists. Um, and so very stressful. Um, but I was very happy with the um, Hidden Palace art. The foreground, I was never happy with the background. I could never, yeah, I could never get the background I wanted. And so I was very um, upset when it was cut from the game. It's, it's, I, rec I remember going, sitting down to play it. I think I'd heard that there was issues with programming time and there was issues with memory. And I remember, you know, the, it, it being done and going in to play it. And I mean, you know, we, you know gold, we locked going in to play the game and Hidden Pal Zone isn't there. And I went and talked to Mark or no, Mark would have been gone. Went and talked to somebody and they said, oh yeah, sorry, it, we didn't have memory. We ran out of memory, we had to cut it. And I was pissed. I mean, but then memory was always the issue back then. Um, and it wasn't until a few months later after the game had shipped that all of a sudden in, in the various magazines, um, you started seeing stuff pop up where somebody had hacked into it with a game genie and found it. And so I'm like, wait a minute, if there wasn't memory, <laughs> if there wasn't room for it, why is it still on the cartridge? Um, the biggest reason, and it turns out that yeah, the actual reason it was cut, there wasn't time to finish the program. Um, and so it was playable, the, 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 the genie version was playable, but, but buggy, but, but not, not finished at all. Um, so I, so I, a part of me was glad that at least some people would see it, at least some images were ending up in the magazines. Um, I was also very happy that, because the next level I did after Hidden Palace was Oil Ocean. Yeah, you know, I, I was glad it got in the game. Um, you know, Brenda Ross and some of the other artists, all their work ended up being cut. Um, some of it early on, you know, they'd only started on it or had concept stuff done. Other ones, like uh, a couple of ones that Brenda worked on, were finished. She, they were done um, on the artwork side and were cut. And so I felt good that at least I had a level in the game. And... Uh, but like, yeah, Oil Ocean's another one. Yamaguchi, the background on Oil, the foreground is mine. The background's Yamaguchi's. Um, no one was ever happy with my background. I half remember being pretty happy with my background on that one, but I don't remember what it looked like. <laughs> I, I have a memory, but I'm pretty sure I'm remembering a similar background I did for one of the Ratchet and Clank backgrounds. Um, but yeah, so Yamaguchi did the industrial oil refinery background on oil ocean. I remember um, coming into work and uh, Deborah, our office manager, comes up and says, hey, uh, Craig, do you have a passport? 
And I said, uh, yes, but it's, it's, not, it's not valid anymore. She goes, oh, well, you, you need to go to San Francisco tomorrow and get one because you're going to Tokyo on Wednesday. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And yeah, they needed somebody to hand deliver the, the ROM set to Tokyo, Japan. Um, and uh, apparently the, you know, you, you, you know, that you could, you know, wire it over electronically, but the modems were so slow and so undependable. Um, is that a word? Uh, that it was cheaper and faster to physically have someone carry them over. Um, I've, I've never really gotten a good, I've never, why me? <laughs> You know, there are people that that is their job, is to hand deliver, hand couriers. Um, and so I just, I have to think that, um, oh, it's the VP of Sega Japan, Sega America, Toyota, was a really nice guy. And I'd met him a couple of times. And I, I've always just thought that he wanted to reward some people on the team that weren't getting, you know, I don't know. So anyway, so yeah, so they gave me the chipset and, um, I got on a plane, and before I went on the plane, I didn't speak any Japanese. And I mean, I, at the time, I think I could say my pencil is yellow and ask where the bathroom was in Japanese. Because we were taking it, we had a, a tutor at, in, at STI teaching us Japanese. Um, uh, Roger Hector, who was the head of STI at the time, uh, sat down. He'd been to Japan a number of times. And so he told me very sp specific directions on how to get from the plane through customs to get a ticket to get on a bus to take the bus to the hotel I'd be staying at and so I was wonderfully pleasantly surprised that that worked that I did flawlessly got to the airport um, got and then got to my hotel and then I was told um, someone would call me from from Sega Japan and give me directions on, on what to do next and <clears throat> I think that night or yeah, that got a phone call and in broken English was given directions of how to go across the street to the train station and catch this train to this train station and go up three levels to this train, this convoluted video game experience of trying to get from my hotel to the headquarters, so, uh, Sega headquarters. So I go through it, I get through it all fine. I come off the last train station, I step onto the street and this is where Guardian Angels, Luck, somebody was watching over me. As I step onto the street, I look down the street, and there's this building on the left-hand side with a huge Sega on the side. I'm like, yes, I made it. Completely blanking on the fact that the directions were when you come out of the train station and look down the street, it's across from the building that has the Sega. The building you want is on the right-hand side of the building, the street. So I walk down, I go into the office, you know, go into the front doors. And this, you know, this young woman behind the counter doesn't speak any English. She's not expecting me. And so she kind of signals me to just wait for a little bit. And she goes and she leaves, you know, and goes in the back. And so, um, and out comes, she comes out with this, with this, this guy. And um, all I remember is Doi-san. I don't remember his whole name. He's one of two people in all of Japan I personally know. <laughs> and it hadn't even occurred to me to look at him up or think, you know, when I was over there. Because we, we hadn't even, he'd worked on Dick Tracy at STI, along with um, a young woman named Amy something, had been there in the early days of STI. And we'd cross paths and talked and had lunch together, but had, you know, um, but we knew each other. And so he walks out and he sees me, he's like, Craig, and I go, Doi-san, what are you doing here? And he's like, what are you doing here? So he finds out why I'm there, makes a few calls, realizes I'm just in the wrong building. Takes me across the street, um, introduces me to the producer there. I hand him the chipset. He says, thank you very much. My job was done. Um, that's, that's, and I was, I was to be there for, I think, initially seven days. And um, the producer then asked me if I had any plans or if I knew anybody in Japan. I says, well, no, and the only person I know here is, is Doi-san. And he says, oh, so he grabbed his assistant and said, hey, show Mr. Shit, take, take tomorrow off, show Mr. Stitt around the city. Yeah, so we, yeah, he showed it the next morning, this tiny little car. I mean, this thing was tiny. 
And we're driving on the freeways in Tokyo and it was terrifying, but he was a really nice guy and we drove around and did all sorts of sightseeing. Mm-hmm. So between him and Doisan and then Amy, you know, uh, Doisan was able to, you know, introduce me to Amy. And between them, I had a tour guide the whole rest of the trip. And then about a week in, uh, Rick Makarak, who had done some of the level designs and, 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 and worked on Sonic 2 as well, showed up. And he had hand carried the paper art for the box cover and the manual and that kind of stuff. And so we spent, the, he, he was there for a few more days and then we both went back together. There was Sonic Tuesday. So the whole Sonic team had been brought to New York City where the big press party, big Sonic Tuesday. And so I'm sitting in the limo um, out in front of the hotel getting ready to be driven over to the Toys R Us or wherever they had the party. And um, Jonathan Taylor Thomas of Home Improvement, um, because they had a bunch of kid celebrities um, come in to play play Sonic 2 for the cameras. And uh, Home Improvement was at the kind of the peak of its uh, popularity at the time. And uh, so Jonathan Taylor Thomas, who I was just recently watched a video from that. And it's like, he's so little, he's so young. I'd forgotten how young he was. Um, gets in the car and he sees me sitting there and I've, I've got my, actually I've got that jacket on that's behind me, the Sonic 2 jacket. I think he had one on as well. And he says, oh, are you security? I said, oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the artists on the game. <gasps> Can I have your autograph? <laughs> So every time I see him in any TV show or anywhere, it's like, hey, hey, he asked for my autograph. He asked for my autograph. One of the other uh, kid celebrities they had there was uh, Dustin Diamond. Uh, from He was, uh, played a character named Screech on Saved by the Bell, another show that was big at the time. And that night, we, a bunch of us had gone out for dinner, and I ended up sitting next to Dustin and his dad and talking and, and, and whatnot. And... Uh, we were coming back to the hotel and we get off and we get up and his room was just a couple doors down from mine. So we say goodbye and I step into my room and I walk over and I flip on the television and just by chance, Saved by the Bell is on TV and Dustin's there doing his screech thing. And it was just bizarre to literally have just said goodnight to him and then turn on and have it be on TV. A huge shout out to Craig for taking the time to speak to me. I found that absolutely fascinating and it's like a dream come true. I've been Retro Faith. Thanks for watching. Keep it retro.